You never heard that before, did you? <laughs> well, that's what put my father out of the service when they told him he was going to have to fly a desk and not a plane. He, uh, so he would say, you go, father? Yes, he was a, a <coughs> first pilot. Then <coughs> he was a pilot? When they told him that he was going to fly a desk and not a plane, he said, I'm out of here. So wasn't interested in staying in unless he was <coughs> flying. He wanted to get out. Yes. But that was in 47. Well, I didn't especially want to get out, but I felt <coughs> after Japan surrendered, <coughs> there was nothing more to do. You just sat around doing nothing. So I figured I'd get out. I could still get out and get back to school and get my last two years of engineering school. Okay. I wouldn't have got back in if I hadn't gone back to the same school. <clears throat> well, my name is Kim Hobbs, and this is uh, September the 8th, 2007. Uh, what is your full name, sir? Richard W. Or Richard William Ulbrick. When and where were you born? New York City. And what year? Uh, 1921. What squadron were you in? The 512 Squadron. What was life in the United States during the Great Depression? During the Great Depression? Well, it was, I was only in high school or, or grammar school, so I, I really didn't get the full impact of it. Uh, my my father had, was dead then. He passed away as a war veteran from World War, uh, World War I. And my mother received a pension uh, for my father's military service. And she worked outside the house, a uh, housekeeper, and uh, so she, she, we managed to get along. Okay. Where were you and what were you doing when you heard that Pearl Harbor had been attacked? The, the first? The, when you got the news that Pearl Harbor had... Oh, been I was just coming back from Sunday school there on Sunday morning. And I, uh, first I couldn't believe my ears, so I got another couple of stations. And they all said the same thing. So I was starting a job the next day on Monday. And this was with the Navy, Navy Department as, a, as an engineering aide, or you might say an assistant engineer. I had two years. And uh, I just noticed as I looked out the window, there was long lines there in front of the, uh, the, the Navy re re recruiting office. And it was the same for the Army and the Marines. They, they had all the people they could handle for each day for, oh, I don't know how long, about a week. What level of education? You said you got two years of college before two you Two years of engineering school. Did you try and join the Army Air Forces or just join the Army? When no, I, would, uh, I applied for the aviation cadet training three times for the Army and once for the Navy. I got turned down each time on one eye it wasn't 2020, it was 2030. Couldn't quite make the 2020. But if I keep both eyes open, I could see 2020. And so I kept trying to, to, to get past the exam somehow. And I read one morning uh, about a new invention, uh, contact lenses that were invented in Vienna. And this was just before we, the United States got in the war. Uh, 
a Viennese doctor invented them there. And so I, I followed up on it in New York, and I found a place that made contact lenses. And I had them made me a, a, a pair of lenses. And I uh, applied for the exam again. By that time, the pressure was on me to uh, to uh, find a, a slot as a ground crew cadet, not a flying cadet, because the draft board was hot on my tail, and I didn't want to get drafted. So I, I applied to transfer from ground crew to flying cadet. And uh, I took the exam with the contact lenses, and as it happened, there was a, a, a rather sharp uh, Austrian, looks like an Austrian refugee Jewish doctor. And he, he knew about contact lenses, and he felt the edge of it. And of course, he failed me. And when I was going out, there was a first lieutenant uh, when, I, when, I passed, when I left the uh, exam. And I said, when can I take the exam again? He says, you're not going to take the exam again. You're going to sit on the ground and wave at him. I said to myself, I says, yeah, we'll see. So I took the exams, uh, physical exams, was scheduled at Governor's Island, New York. And uh, the second, uh, second core area headquarters of Fort uh, New York was part of that. Uh, they were just across the, the, the harbor in Manhattan. So I went up there and talked this little gal into uh, transferring my uh, papers, a whole record that she had there, up to my grandparents' address in Massachusetts, which was in the first core area. And from there, they, uh, I applied again, and I got another schedule for another flying cadet exam, a transfer. And I had a, a sergeant that gave the exam, and he couldn't see the chart at all himself. And so uh, uh, I, I just read what the, the, the lines I, I, I needed, and I, I, I passed it all right. And uh, when, I, when I was called up about six weeks later, uh, <clears throat> I was working for the Continental Can Company in, let's see, in, in Jersey City, I think. And uh, uh, they asked me, do you, do you want to go? And I said, yeah. I said, well, we can get you off. We were working on Navy contracts, and they were. They were building Navy flying boats. And I said, uh, I said uh, we, we can get you off, even though you've signed up with the Air Force. People didn't know it was easier to get a, uh, a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a uh, deferment to, to get off? A yeah, it's easier to get you off from the services themselves than they were from a draft board. Because the draft board had, I, I guess they had a quota they had to fill. And if you were there, you were drafted. So, but I, I told them, thanks, but no thanks. I wanted to go and start my aviation cadet training. So they said, OK. And so, so about three months after, or no, well, not that long. About uh, one month or so after that, I was called up to start my training. And I uh, got on a train up in Boston. And we went down to uh, 
oh, Kentucky or Tennessee, some base there. And they gave me another physical exam there. But in the meantime, they were, had a shortage of navigators so that they lowered the bars for navigators and I could pass it without the contact lenses so I didn't use them any time after that. Because when I went to navigation school, they kept two eyes open and I could see anything I needed. So uh, when I got to navigation school, they had a, a system there where you, you um, had ground school in the morning and you flew in the afternoon. I guess that was to have guys uh, be more awake so they wouldn't fall asleep in the morning. And then they flew in the afternoon. But the drawback for that was you get these puffy, cumulus clouds in the afternoon, and it was rough flying underneath them. And we flew at low altitude, and it was, it was really rough reading, reading drift, uh, drift meters and trying to write uh, uh, course corrections and all that. Uh, I got airsick my first three missions. So they called me up and said, so you're gonna, you, we're going to flunk you in navigation school. Uh, you have your choice now for pilot or bombardier. So by that time, uh, now uh, to your flying, you know, I thought they might send me to fighter school. Uh, and flying in fighters, you do a lot of acrobatics. And I thought I might get airsick there. So I said, I want to be a bombardier. So they sent me to bombardier school. And I flew the same missions over in bombardier school because they learned navigation too. And the same missions over again that I did in navigation school. Only I didn't get airsick because they flew theirs in the morning when the air was nice and smooth. And oh, it was, it was, it was, there was a breeze. I did, I had an excellent bombing record in bombardier school. And I remember asking him a question. I said, can I use the bomb site to read drift on the white caps on, on the ocean? And they said, oh, no, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You're going so much faster than the, the white caps. And the white caps are moving. You, you can't do that. So one of the, fir the first mission, I, uh, they were short of navigators, and they asked for volunteers. And I says, I don't care. I don't mind flying if you need me. So I flew my first three missions as a navigator uh, and reading drift on the right caps every time. And we came in with the course corrections, which saved time. So I, don't, I'm not, I remember one mission, we flew all the way to southern France and, and flew back and uh, we were the second ship out of 28 of our, of, of our uh, bomb group, the four squadrons. We were the second plane out of the four squadrons that landed. And they told me I couldn't see well enough. And I couldn't read drift on the white caps. And uh, as it went on, uh, I got the best bombing record of any bombardier in our squadron while I was there. I know that. Uh, I could see the records. but And I think, I'm not sure, I'm just guessing, but I think I had the best bombing record in the history of our bomb squadron or our bomb group. Uh, Were there many accidents in training? Do you remember? No. 
there were accidents, but I never was involved in any, and I didn't. I just heard of one. We had one, one poor guy. He was flying as a navigator, and uh, uh, he was in one accident coming in for landing, and the, the pilot got killed. And then he was in another one, and somebody got, he got cracked up. I don't know. And then the third time, though, he went and they went out over the Alps, bailed out, and they never heard from him again. So we don't know what, what happened to him. What planes were they using when you were training? B-24s. That's all we had was B-24s. See, were you, okay, were you an officer or, or an enlisted man? I was an officer. I was a bombardier. Bombardiers, navigators, and the two pilots were officers. At what rank? Well, you start off as a second lieutenant, and then three months later, you got promoted to first lieutenant. So that's what I came home as, a, a first lieutenant. If I had behaved myself better, I could have come back as a captain. But I was having too much fun traveling around the country. What was your MOS or your specialty in the military? Uh, 1035. Uh, there also, that was a bombardier, and 1034 was a navigator. So I did both. In fact, I did, as I said, on one, on three missions, I did both at the same time. <laughs> it was easy. Because all of the, the, the all the bombardier has to do after he sets up for the bomb run is hit a switch and uh, open the bomb bay doors, and then uh, when it comes times to bomb for bombs away, if you're lined up ready, the crosshairs are holding on the target, and they should be uh, if you if you've done your work right. Uh, you just hit a little lever that little, and then uh, lock it in with a little button, and the bombs go away automatically. This is part of your Norden bomb site? Yes, that's part of the Norden bomb site. Uh, how, does the, uh, how does the Norden bomb site work? Well, <clears throat> basically, it has two gyros. The gyro is steady, uh, connected to a cardan, which is connected to the site. So as the plane moves and rolls, and there's motion there, uh, the gyros take care of that motion, and your, your site picture is quite steady. And that's the nice thing about the Norden. Now, they, uh, they brought in some Sperry's in the last, oh, I'd say uh, six or eight months of the war. They had some Sperry bomb sites. I had had some, I had a little bit of training on the Sperry, so I could handle those. But uh, I didn't like this. Uh, the Sperry was a little more accurate uh, than the Norden. If everything was going right, but everything, if it's not going right, the Norden was better off because it, you, you could make adjustments with the Norden. With the Sperry, you couldn't make adjustments for anything. Uh, I had a Sperry bomb site freeze up on me on a bomb run, and that was, that was tough. So, the, what, what was your toughest bomb run that you remember? Oh, and the Brenner Pass, that the same place, that bridge there that you asked me the first question, that same target. <coughs> the problem was, up to you go fly up the Brenner Pass, they got Germans on with the anti-aircraft guns on the side of the mountains, so we used to say they're shooting down at you. But uh, that was somewhat of an exaggeration. 
but rather than go up the uh, Brenner Pass, where, where you get exposed to that heavy flak, they went cross country. And so the flak guns were behind the mountain. They couldn't shoot at you for about the last, oh, the last minute or so. And the only trouble is you had about a, a, a 55 second bomb run to, to hit the target, and that's n normally not enough to, to, get, to, to get your, your course killed and your rate killed, and so the crosshairs stay on the target. So my first, the, the first mission to that uh, Brenner Pass the Avisio River uh, Viaduct uh, Bridge uh, took two dry runs because I couldn't get set up in time. So that we were flying with a major. Our squatter commander was flying in a co-pilot seat. And he says, hey, come on now, I'm getting anxious. And I said, he, I'm dying and he's getting anxious. And so the navigator rolled me out. He noticed that uh, I, I had a, a, a three degree correction just before we should have bombs away. So he told the pilot to fly uh, a three degree correction uh, to the left, which brought him upwind of the target and I was able to get my course killed faster. So uh, the last instant on that third time around, uh, the crosshairs were staying on the target, so I got the trigger and let the bombs go, and I was just holding my head in my hands. Uh, I knew it, we had bombing tables, and from my altitude, I, uh, I estimated it would take about 59 or 58 seconds for the bombs to hit. So I uh, looked at my, when I saw the bomb, looked at my watch, when I saw the bombs hit uh, 58 seconds later, I said, those are my bombs. And they missed by a half, no, I hit that target right on the nose. Uh, the previous target uh, on another mission, uh, uh, one of the marks of a good bombardier was to bring back an accurate uh, tally of his uh, bomb hits. I reported that uh, we missed the target by half a mile at five o'clock. And every bombardier and every pilot in the squadron said we hit the target. And I come back and said we missed it. And they said, ah, he made a mistake, his first mistake. And <laughs> they found that uh, I was the only one that was right because we missed. So they, everybody saw somebody else's bombs, some other squadron's bombs, and not ours. So when did you fly your first mission overseas? When? Your first mission overseas. Well, it was in, 19, uh, it was in the, uh, the latter half, uh, just after July, about August of 1943. The best I can remember. We had a record of those, but uh, I, I moved around so much I didn't have all my records. Maybe that's in my records that are still home. I don't know. So your first base would have been in North Africa of 43? My first base was, no, it was, I, was, I flew out of Italy. They were already moved from North Africa to Italy okay. when our squadron got there. Were you ever wounded? No, and I was never wounded, and nobody on any of my planes, that I, no crew that I flew with was ever wounded. Any close calls, engine shot out? Yeah, we had, we had bullet holes, and we came back from our, our longest mission was to to uh, Bratislava, Czechoslovakia, 
which is right on the Danube River, on the, the, uh, Bratislava is on the north side of the Danube River. The, the Danube flowed at that point east and west. Uh, most of the Danube flew, uh, flowed uh, uh, north and south, but rivers wind around, you know. And so we were a, a long way from home. And we had one engine either shot out or burned out. Anyway, it was smoking, so the pilot shut it off and we come all the way home from that longest mission on three engines, and we made it. It's said that there are no atheists in the foxholes. To what degree did your experience in the military and in combat affect your religious faith? Well, I had it before I, before I started. I used to have a little pocket Bible. And on the flying out to the target, I'd read some of that. And uh, uh, the 91st Psalm it was, uh, was one I used for a great, very great, great deal. I call that the combat psalm. And maybe you're acquainted with it. I don't know. But uh, I use that usually going up uh, to the... Uh, Target, and then after bombs away, uh, I usually slip home from there on. So, so I, an answer to your question is yes, uh, I did have a, a very strong conscious need for divine guidance, and 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 I reinforced it from the little Bible I had with me. Again, with the 91st Psalm, especially. I see. I think the, the military provided you with a, uh, with a pocket Bible? Uh, no, I, I got one from a chaplain. Well, what would you consider your closest call of all the missions that you had over there? Closest call? Coming back with uh, one engine out? Oh, well, that, that wasn't a close call at all. It was just... As long as the, the three engines were working all the way home, there was nothing close about it. But my, close, well, my closest call was, uh, we went over, it was, I think it was over Vienna, when a flak, piece of flak came in and uh, hit right, right alongside of me in the side of the plane, and it hit, one of the no bullets in the machine gun belt for the nose turret, and it bent the bullet over at, at, at an angle. It just hit the nose and bent it over. Because after we come off the target, the, the uh, navigator went through the, the ammo box there, and he picked out that bullet and showed it to me. I said, yeah, I guess that was close all right. It was heading right for me, but the bullet stopped it. Did your reasons for joining the military, whether you, were, you weren't drafted, but patriotism or adventure, did any of that change over time during the war? No. Well, uh, uh, I guess some things would change in the military because your appetite sometimes would change because you, when you're getting sea rations and uh, uh, sea ration meat and vegetable stew and spam. Oh, I hate spam. I haven't, I haven't had a mouthful of spam since the war and I don't intend to start. Did you receive any medals? Yeah. Which one? I got the DFC. That's a Dis Distinguished Flying Cross. And... Uh, Do you remember which... Mission? Huh? Do you remember which mission you got the no. DFC? Okay. 
Oh, I think uh, the mission that we flew on was when I lost an engine, or froze up over the target and we bombed manually. Uh, the pilot flew a manual mission. He has a needle, a, a PDI, that's the pilot directional indicator, and uh, he, he can fly in the center of that needle. And, and, and the corrections from the bomb site would show up as the needle moved. And uh, it was slower. It was not as, as efficient as the automatic pilot. But if, if, uh, if the automatic pilot or the bomb site froze up, you had to fly that, and you're lucky if you could. So I, uh, what we dropped on, a, on this PDI mission, and uh, the pilot put a correction in the last second and managed, uh, we, we, we missed the bridge itself. We were hitting a bridge, and uh, we hit the butt, the abutment for the bridge. So those bombs there give it a, a seismic effect. It shakes the ground so the bridge will fall of its own weight. And we thought we knocked out the bridge, but... Uh, they had to go back again later. The Germans built up the bridge, and so it was had to be knocked out again. And I guess we just didn't make that mission. How close were you to the the rest of the crew? Did you <coughs> consider them your? your oh, buddies? not very. Well, my navigator could see I was enjoying the war more than he was, so he used to hang around. Uh, Whenever I'd go, he'd, he'd go too, but he never had any money. Or he, he sent home his money for an allotment, and he, he, he gambled in the officers' club. And so he, I'd have to lend him some money to, to get by until payday. He paid me back, though. I mean, but, uh, and, uh, oh, I, I was fairly friendly with him, but my, my, I was mostly friendly with my nose gunner. Uh, his name was Mortimer Cohen. Morty Cohen was from the Bronx, and he's Jewish, and he'd be up in the nose toward uh, cracking Jewish jokes. And yeah, he, he was a character. And... Uh, he was telling me, he was telling us that uh, this movie actress, remember Shelley Winters? Oh, he uh, he was going to acting school with Shelley Winters in New York. He didn't go to college, and uh, he w affected a. a a clipped British accent, and he's calling her Shelley instead of Shirley. And so he said, the name stuck. And so she kept the name Shelley, and her, for her real name was Weintraub. And so he, he, they, between the two of them, I guess, one of them, uh, I guess uh, Morty picked out the name of Winters. So she became Shelley Winters, and nobody knew that. And there I was flying with the guy who named her, and yeah, that was yeah, that was some of the crazy things that happened. Do you remember anything about the commanding officers, your squadron, or your group commander? Oh uh, no! We when I I flew with them, uh, Colonel Graf was a great guy. We liked him, and our squadron commander was a major. He was a he was a good guy too, but he was not like our 
like Colonel Graff. Colonel Graff was a faux colonel. And on one mission, we flew up the Adriatic Sea to the edge of, uh, uh, well, I guess it was Italy. And as far as we could see, the carpet, all, everything was covered over with a layer of clouds. You couldn't see the target. So <clears throat> Colonel uh, said, we're going to hit our alternate, first alternate target. And so I said, well, we, uh, we can't see that either. And he said, well, we'll go over it. And, uh, and, uh, we had a radar bomber, a navigator with us, and he had a radar scope. And he could look right through the clouds. But it wasn't connected to the bomb site. So that all he could do was call off dropping angles. Or, or, and, uh, and I'd try to approximate those with the bomb site. Uh, but it, it, it's not, it was far from accurate because you could get three drop, you had time for three dropping angles. And if you didn't get close on your third one, you just missed. And the bombs would fall uh, close by, you hope, but you didn't know. And so uh, I, I called up the, the colonel and uh, well, I called up the pilot and told him, then he told the colonel that we were uh, our orders, and he the orders came from him, came down through him, that uh, we shouldn't drop uh, bombs in North Italy and Yugoslavia except visually. If you can see the target, you can drop. If, uh, if you can't see it, don't drop. So I reminded him of, of his, his standing order. And he says, yeah, you're right. And so he says, we'll fly over one time. And if we can see any breaks in the clouds, we'll drop. Otherwise, we won't. I said, so, yeah, I knew, I knew very well that we didn't have any breaks in the clouds. And if we did have any breaks, they would be so small we couldn't set up a bomb run. And so we just took the bombs home, uh, got them over the Adriatic Sea. We had had an accident when some, they brought some bombs home on another mission and one of them fell loose off the shackle and blew up on a runway and blew the whole plane and crew and everything up. So the, the colonel says, uh, he didn't want to have that happen again, so he says, drop them in the Adriatic Sea. And so we, I, uh, I safetyed the bombs with safety wire, uh, which we, uh, on the bomb run we took out the safety wire, but uh, I put the safety wire back and just uh, salvoed the bombs, got rid of them. And they had, I guess they had a few fish in the, Adriatic Sea. What was discipline or regulations like uh, at your base there in Italy? Oh, they were easy. They were, as long as you were there for your missions, they didn't really care where you went or anything about it. And so, uh, as, as soon as I flew a mission, I'd catch a, fl a plane going up to Rome and spend about a week there. In the wintertime, you know, we wouldn't fly every mission. So I'd stay up there maybe five, six days and then catch a plane back. And, and they'd ask, yeah, you haven't seen you around. I said, oh, I've been around, just like that. And, that's Rome, it was 300 miles away. What's the, the funniest episode that you remember there at the base or at Rome? What's the what? The best time that you had either at base or, or at Rome when you weren't on a mission. Oh, the best time I had was in Rome. Uh, I used to date uh, an Italian general's daughter. 
and she worked in the uh, the officers' Red Cross Club, and so I knew uh, <clears throat> she had lots of chance to, to to get dates. So I went and did something different. I invited her to go to the uh, opera with with me. And that, that set me apart immediately from, from the rest of the officers. And I, I was a first lieutenant and uh, quite knowledgeable about the opera. And so uh, I said, we go to dinner first and then go to the opera, because the opera was about start about 7 o'clock. And uh, so she says I have to meet her mother. I says, fine. Her mother was the, 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 the wife of this Italian general. Uh, she was from the uh, Tyrol. I guess she must have been in the, Ger the German-speaking part, or must have been spent some time in the German-speaking part, because she spoke a little German. And I did, too. I had it in high school, two years of German. And so... I talked to her, and uh, I guess I, I, I convinced her I was harmless, so she let me take out her daughter, and yeah, that was, she was nice. She was good looking. Mm. <laughs> uh, can you describe your, your flight suit and your equipment, what a Norden bomb site looked like? Oh, yeah. yeah. The whole, our whole plane was built around the Norden bomb site because that was the reason why we were up there. Otherwise, it would be just a free trip on the government. And what else? we had a, a, a heated suit because it got cold up there. Uh, going up over the Alps, uh, I know, uh, we had a thermometer on the outside of the nose. It was minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Inside the plane, it was minus 40. But that's still pretty chilly, even with the heated suit. And over the heated suit, uh, we had a flak helmet. We put that on, or going over the target, and. We had a flak vest we could put on o over the target. But that's when we got most of our, our flak. And the fighters didn't like to go in their own flak. So they'd wait for us to come off, come past the flak, or they'd get us before we get in the flak. And uh, so between the flak and the fighters, well, we. we uh, it got pretty hairy at times. We were bullet holes all over the plane. <clears throat> Did you inspect the bombs before takeoff? Inspect them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I looked at them and saw that the wiring, the uh, safety wire was in them. And, uh, but there was really nothing to inspect because the, the armorers put them on. They loaded them up the night before or early in the morning. About uh, five o'clock in the morning, they loaded them up, and so oh, you had to go. You had to go by what what they said. There were many, there were many jobs that were specialized that we just had to take take what comes. So you said that one mission was tough because you only had like fifty seconds to get set up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was. What if, if what, what what do you do on a typical? You got three minutes to line up for the uh, well. The we the, the, the usual time. They what they do is fly up to an IP, an, an initial point, which was selected to be about oh ten minutes approximately from the from bombs away, and. The IP was generally uh, that distance away, so it would give you about nine or ten minutes to get to the target. 
<coughs> and the uh, <coughs> what I used to we used to the, the navigator and I would do is uh, when I had a navigator I uh, that was fine when I didn't I did it myself. Uh, <coughs> You would use an E6P hand computer and draw the course on there, and where they intersect, that's where we were. And I'd see the angle there, how many degrees off we were from what the compass showed, and call the pilot up and correct them three degrees left or two degrees right or wherever. And the pilots already took it. They never, they never argued. Whenever, whenever you give a pilot a course correction, they took it. Uh, and uh, uh, I think if you told him to fly, turn around and fly backwards, he'd take it. Because they don't argue with it. They're like, we used to call them high altitude truck drivers. And, uh, uh, <coughs> They, on this one mission that I'm telling you about was the short runs. I had to take two uh, two bomb runs, two sh two dry runs. That means fly over them and don't drop, because I just wasn't expecting that shorter mission. And uh, that shorter bomb run, I just couldn't get set up, and I didn't want to dump the bombs just to miss. So we went around twice, not dropping. Then I dropped on the third, and we hit. Uh, and that got loused up. There was a I, there was a bombardier, a former bombardier instructor from bombardier school. He thought he knew more than we, than the rest of us did. We were. We, I had had half my combat missions in, and he didn't have any. He was on his first mission. He was using the bomb site, and you can't do that because his pilot is flying a plane, watching the lead plane, and you can't have somebody putting course corrections in when you're flying formation. So any. Any dope would, would, would know that. But he was going to show what he could do. And so on this run, he dropped on the first bomb run, and he missed by about a mile. And he hit, he hit the other side of the mountain. And uh, when we got back, after we had a... For, for, for what I had was a perfect mission. The, our major, our squadron commander, he was mad as they could be. He was so mad he had tears in his eyes because at this guy for dropping on, using the bomb site himself in, in formation. And he never had a chance to lead as far as I was there because uh, the war was over before he ever got close to it. Uh, yeah, that's that was a frustrating mission. For on another mission, there was an, uh, another pilot. We used to do gunnery uh, practice for the gunners. We used to set up these uh, uh, cement blocks on the ground. And they would fly past them with a low altitude, maybe 50 feet or something like that. They'd fly past them, and the gunners would fly and shoot at them as we, as we passed them. I, I don't think it was very good practice, but uh, anyway, they, we had to satisfy somebody that they, we were training. And so in the meantime, what they had there, they had the uh, the entire Allied fleet led by the British in uh, Toronto Harbor. This was this city was a British base, and 
So you, they had the whole fleet there, uh, Americans and British, mostly British. And he comes over the water about 25 feet, and he buzzed the whole British fleet. And uh, by the time he hit the ground, it was about uh, 15 minutes later, they got a complaint for going. I went all the way up to Eisenhower and all the way down. And our squadron commander was, was had to take all this. And he was as mad as he could be. There were tears in his eyes. He was so mad at this guy. Well, uh, uh, most of the pilots, the first pilots, the captains, became captains about Oh, a year after they arrived, well, it took him another six months to get his promotion. Well, you also knew uh, you had navigation training. Yeah, all the bombardiers did. The only thing we didn't have that the navigators had was celestial, flying at night. But we never flew at night, so any, for practical purposes, we could do anything the navigators could. What did it mean to navigate by dead reckoning? It means by using the compass and using uh, maps and a, a pair of dividers and measuring. Just using your maps, basically what it means. What was the most accurate means of navigation? Accurate? <laughs> using, using a bomb sight. Because <laughs> with the bomb sight, you could easily get the drift. If you could see the white caps, you could get the drift. In fact, I was even reading drift off the clouds because we were going so much faster than the clouds were drifting that I could read drift and get a pretty close approximation, within one degree. I could do that with just with the bomb site. So with that, it made it easy. Just made the, uh, give the pilot the, the, the drift correction and let him fly. And when you hit the coast of Italy, it's jagged. And you can usually tell where you are because the coast is so, so jagged that uh, uh, you could just, when they hit, you just give them a course correction to home. Was there ever a mission where you were required to, to use one of the machine guns? No, no, I wasn't. I went to gunnery school and could use one if I wanted to. I would just tell the gunner, Go fly somewhere else, or take another machine gun, and then that was. If you could do that, it left the the flight engineer free to make any immediate fixes if we got hit by flak. So the pilots liked that, and the the uh, engineers liked it. So the the engineer. The radio operator, let's see, they were uh, tech sergeants, and all the other gunners were staff sergeants, one rank below. What, what rank uh, were you when you finished up your tour? First lieutenant. Yeah. And what time, what was your last mission? Yeah, we, we, Remember the date? That's the mission I talked the colonel into, uh, into not dropping the bombs by his own orders. I reminded him what it amounted to. This, this, this radar operator we had with us on that mission, he tried to ball me out for, for telling the colonel about that. He says, yeah, I had a good fix on that uh, coastline. I said, yeah, you had a good fix, but by the time you flew in there, uh, there's no telling where the bombs would hit. 
And he, he just shut up. He couldn't. He was all set to try to ball me out, and I talked right back to him. And yeah, we, but in a combat crew, rank isn't as pervasive as you might think. Because we all, we all knew our jobs. We all had a job to do. And we all supposedly did it to the best of our ability. Well, if you had anything to, uh, how do you feel about, uh, do you consider yourself a hero for your service <clears throat> overseas? No, I, uh, I was trained to be a bombardier, and I was good at it. And that was it. Did you stay in the service uh, after your? Yeah, I, well, I stayed in the reserve. And uh, when I was, um, I, let's see, uh, who was I? Uh, I was, a, get to be a, a major in the reserve. I. I could see the, I was never going to be in a combat crew again because they had new equipment and they'd have to train me over again and they wouldn't bother training me over again. They, uh, they would take a new guy and train him from the beginning. So I said, I want to be an engineer officer. So I transferred, became an engineer officer and I had some good projects to work on. I picked them out myself and uh, that I, I knew I could help with. And I went right on up to, to uh, I retired uh, as a full colonel. I got the uh, uh, full colonel rank of about, uh, oh, six months before I had to retire. And I had to retire by statute. But at age 60, you, you were retired whether you want to go or not. Well, which engineering project did you work on that you enjoyed the most? Oh. Uh, well, there was a, the, the, the SEALs. Well, let me, how do I explain this? When a pilot got up to altitude and he wanted to uh, throttle back on the engines to just cruise, uh, he directed the slipstream, the, uh, uh, some hot air from the engines through the ports and the side of the engine. Now, around those ports, there was a, a seal. And uh, they were burning those out almost e every mission they flew on. They were burning them out. Now, they only cost $30, but the, the ground crew would have to get out there in the wintertime in the snow, if necessary, and uh, lift up the cowl and, and change those. Uh, on the on on the cowl over the engine, and so I knew something was wrong that that the, uh, we could do something. So I I just got in touch with the people that are making them, and I said, "This is not a complaint. I'm just just tr we got problems. We the Air Force got problems with the seals." Now you're making those seals. Uh, I, I called up and made an appointment with their uh, chief a engineer and we'll, flew out to California to talk to them at uh, Consolidated Volte. And uh, I said, has there been a change in the materials that could give us something that stands up better. And he says, yeah, yeah, we got, we got a silicone uh, rubber that the, that the heat doesn't bother. And I says, 
I says, okay, we want, we want about 10 of them. How much will 10 cost us to make 10 of them for, for trial? And he says, oh, $4,000. So I says, fine. I said, I went back to the debate, to my office and put, the, uh, put a pitch on to get $4,000 which was chicken feed, really. Some of those are much more expensive. And they were up in the millions. And so I said, uh, I said, I would like to get $4,000 to get some of these new seals and see how they work out. And he said, fine. They gave me the 4,000, or they, they made it available. And they uh, wrote a contract for $4,000 for $4, and then on checking up with them later on, I went to see how things were going. They, they suggested that there's a, there's a cowl ring that used to cut in those seals as they tighten it down. They said sharp edges. I uh, said, we can, we can uh, uh, mold those rings, those mounting rings, right in there so they won't cut. I said, that's a great idea. Do it. And so I said, how much more will it raise the price of the cowl seals? Oh, we go up to, let's sell them for $60 from the up. Well, they were going to go up to about 40 or 45 anyway. Uh, so $30 a seal, and they last indefinitely. So I says, do it. I just told him, just like that, do it. And we, uh, that, was a, that was a good, good project to work on. I, from then on, I got the reputation of being an expert in seals. Why, I don't know. They, <laughs> so every seal job that came up, and, and at least one of them came up after that, they gave call me right in on it right off the bat. There, this is you. You, you take this. So I says, fine. No. Which plane? Which type of plane was this with the seal problem? Well, the one on the uh, the seals, uh, the Kurd, surge seal Caldor was on a uh, cargo uh, a C one thirty. And the, the other new one was on a, a C5. That's the big one. Oh, yeah. The huge one with the big nose. And that was a murder because it, they would, they would freeze up at altitude. And when they come down, they wouldn't have time to, to unfreeze. And so when they raised the, the uh, nose up, it would pull out the seal from the from the runner, uh, and the, the poor guys would have a hell of a job getting out there in the cold weather on the flight line, putting those back in with a screwdriver, jamming them back in, and, and so they were overjoyed to get the new uh, something they wouldn't have to do that with, so. Well, how do you feel when you come back to these reunions, seeing people that you flew with? Well, I was a little bit disappointed in today's reunion. I, I was hoping that we, instead of going to different cities, wherever the president happens to come from, I thought we ought to be going to the Air Force Museum because they've got so many things to see and do. Uh, where can we see a real live first class uh, B-24 that can take off? Or where can we see a real live B-17 and a German ME-109 and a German FW-190 and a Jap Zero and uh, uh, a American P-38 and P-47 and uh, 
You got all that to see with first class shape right in front of you. You can spend the whole day there seeing the things there, and it's not very, all that is free. And then uh, when they have meals there, they're, they're moderately priced. They don't charge an arm and a leg like they do other places that cater to your unions. So I was a little disappointed in that today, but I think maybe I got them thinking they, they may do it in another year or two. Uh, but as the Germans say, uh, aber ohne mich, but without me. Well, we thank you for your service, sir. Hmm? I say we thank you for your time today, well, and I thank uh, you for your service. I'm, I'm glad to have had a chance to do all this. I really look forward to it when I was a little kid. I loved airplanes. Not so much to be a pilot myself, but to just be around planes. So, well, that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you, sir.